see everyone here, and uh, this is the final lecture of the final decade of Centenaries lecture series. Uh, the programme was organised by the Library Service here in Cavan in association with the Historian Residence Programme uh, that I've been very, very lucky uh, to be a part of. Uh, it forms part of Cavan County Council's Decade of Centenaries 2023 programme and is supported by the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Geotech, Sport and Media under the Decade of Centenaries 2012-23 to initiative. Uh, since 2020, we've uh, held 25 lectures. Uh, some of them, well, all of them have been, most of them have been online. Uh, and then following the relaxation of COVID-19 restrictions, they've also been in person, thankfully. And then there was another five in-person only lectures as well. Uh, there's also been about 15 short web online webisodes uh, created as well, as well as nine podcast episodes, all dealing with various themes of local, national and international interest. And they're all available online to watch and listen to uh, on Ca uh, Cabin County Council website or the library's Facebook page as well. You can get them there as well. Uh, the wide variety of speakers who participated in the lecture series included some of the best and most high profile historians uh, working in the field of Irish history, uh, such as Professor Dermot Ferreter, uh, uh, Roy Foster here tonight, and David, David McCullough, uh, who was here earlier this year as well. But together, I think the quality of all the lecturers, I think, speaks to Cavan County Council's commitment to the Decade of Centenaries programme and presenting what can be sometimes contentious elements of our past in as fair and unbiased a manner as possible. Uh, we're nearing the end of the Decade programme, but we still have a few more events to go. Take a look in your CELT in the next couple of weeks uh, for part of it there. And there'll also, we hope, be an exhibition dealing with Andy O'Sullivan, who uh, was from cross, almost cross keys, just out the way, uh, who died uh, in late November 1923, so almost 100 years ago, uh, whilst on hunger strike. So we still have a few uh, other things to go along as well. But on a personal level, because this is one of my last uh, uh, jobs, I suppose, as the historian residence for the Decade Programme. I'd like to thank Emma Clancy, our county librarian, for all of our work and for Jonathan here as well, for everything he does as well. Both are modest to a fault and you, you would not know the work they put in. I come up here and stand here and say nice things, but they're the ones that do all the work. And if they weren't there to do that work, none of this would happen. So I just want to thank them. <laughs> Professor Foster is the Emeritus Carroll Professor of Irish History at Hertford College in the University of Oxford. Incidentally, that chair is now known as the Foster Chair in Roy's honour and is held by Ian McBride and our mama. And even though he's sitting in front of me, I don't want to embarrass him, but he is quite simply one of the most important commentators on and historians of Ireland in the modern period. He has a huge list of publications which I'm not going to go through here, but I suppose the ones which have most relevance to this evening are his two volume biography of Yeats, I see one of the volumes there, uh, and his volume of Heating, uh, which I have here, but is also over there as well. Um, that, that, uh, uh, I have to say on a personal level, uh, the two volume biography of Yeats is one of the best biographies I've ever read. Uh, I'm reading the Heaney one at the moment and enjoying it greatly as well. Uh, he is, was elected a Fellow of the British Academy in 1989, a Fellow of the Royal Historical Society in 1986, a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature in 1992, and an Honorary Member of the Royal Irish Academy in 2011. And he has received honorary degrees from the University of Aberdeen, the Queen's University of Belfast, Trinity College, Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, the National University of Ireland, and the University of Edinburgh, as, as well as it is an honorary fellowship at Birkbeck <coughs> College in the University of London. And it's a lovely thing, just when I, I mentioned about the Foster Chair, is that um, Roy's father is from Cavan, and it's a lovely thing that a Cavan name is going to be associated with that chair in, in Oxford for years to come, so it's, it's a lovely, lovely thing that. Uh, and I just see here a copy of Roy's Modern Ireland. I had a copy of that much tattier copy than, than that, but it reminds me of a, a story I told Roy just before we came in, that when I was an undergraduate in Galway, longer ago than I care to remember, uh, there was, uh, I had a wonderful teacher there called Rodo Tui, and in my first year, I, we had to write an essay about late 19th, early 20th century Irish history, whatever it was, and I wrote the essay, and I didn't really understand about sources, how you use them, and maybe have more than one source, but basically the one source I had was that book. And, <laughs> About four pages in, with nothing else referenced but Foster, Modern Ireland, page 10, Foster, Modern Ireland, page 20, and so on and so forth. Garuda Thuy, who was a wonderful, wonderful teacher, uh, I, I got onto page four and I used the second source. And he wrote beside it, finally, with an exclamation mark beside it. And then the next two pages were again Foster, Modern Ireland, Foster, Modern Ireland. And at the end of the essay, you could almost 
hear the irritation in his voice at the end, but he said, if I wanted to know what Roy Foster thought about this, I would ask Roy Foster. <laughs> so it was, it, was, it was an important lesson in, 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 uh, that he was teaching me there. But it's, it's a lovely thing to see Roy here, and I'm so delighted that someone who is, as I say, I've had his books since I was a teenager, and it's lovely to have him here this evening. And the title of Professor Foster's paper tonight is Outfacing Atrocity, Heaning Yates and Meditating in Time of Civil War. So, Thank you, Brendan, for that over-generous introduction. <clears throat> and especially thank you for bringing me back to the land of my forefathers, where I had so many happy holidays when I was young, a long time ago. And it's delightful to have some of my foster family in the room tonight. Um, when Brendan asked me to speak in this series, we wondered what to speak about. I think Brendan initially thought I'd talk about Yeats and the Free State. But it seemed to me 1923 was a year when not only the Civil War had just been never put behind us, but finished officially, and when Yeats won the Nobel Prize, that these were issues that it would be interesting to follow up and to talk about, in a sense, writers and inheritances and how they cope with violence. It also gives me a chance to talk about the relationship between Yeats and Heaney, which is complex. Yeats died the year Heaney was born. There was always a kind of connection made which Heaney deliberately avoided in his own life making, but, but others made it for him. <coughs> he wrote an early essay called Yeats as an example, with a query mark at the end. And the connections were made between them by many critics. And there are parallels, notably in the aura of celebrity that surrounded both of them from their youth. We're opening with a picture of a drawing of Yeats in 1899, when he was 34, by his friend Will Rothenstein. And I'd like to sort of companion pieces with this, I think, lovely photograph of Heaney age 33, backstage before a poetry reading in New York. And it shows, I think, that slight sense of divilment in Heaney's face, which um, before he became the smiling public man was such a lovable part of his personality and which he never lost. But both were young men already on their way to achieving, as Heaney would say later of Yeats, authority within their culture. And this year also marks the centenary of Heaney's death, as well as the centenary of Yeats's Nobel Prize. And that, of course, was a prize given to Heaney as well. So again, there's a connection I'd quite like to follow through here. But mainly, I want to concentrate on the theme that echoes through the work of both writers, the ways that a poet can bear witness to conditions of political violence and everyday terror and how a poetic voice can both convey the essence of that condition and transcend it. And I'd like to explore this by the way that, looking at the way that Yeats and his work responded to political conditions in Ireland a hundred years ago and in the wider world during those years of upheaval that followed World War I and which are, of course, the, the period of the decade of commemorations that we were talking about. I'd also like to match that with Heaney's response to the Troubles in Northern Ireland, both in the early 70s and later on. When Heaney wrote his landmark collection, North, published in 1975, his friend the, or his fellow poet, Richard Murphy, in a very important review of it, said it was a triumph of art over terror, which seems to be making a very large claim. I mean, how can art triumph? over terror for, for all its implications and ambitions. And it's certainly more than Heaney himself would have claimed and more than he set out to do in a world where, as we'll return to at the end of this lecture, people have said that poetry makes nothing happen. But I hope to indicate that there is in the body of Heaney's work a darkening vision and a preoccupation with terror which matches Yeats's and recurs right up to the end. For Yeats, the preoccupation with terror and violence is even more pressing, perhaps most famously in his great and chilling poem, 
1919. Now days are dragon-ridden, the nightmare rides upon sleep. A drunken soldiery can leave the mother murdered at her door to crawl in her own blood and go scot-free. The night can sweat with terror, as before we pierced our thoughts into <coughs> philosophy and planned to bring the world under a rule who are but weasels fighting in a hole. Now, the concreteness of the images in this poem, based in fact on the everyday reality of the black and tan atrocities in Galway, and it's combined with an implication of self-accusation. And both Yeats and Heaney constantly return to the question of what the poet observer can do, what their role is at a time when civilization is collapsing around them. You think of Yeats withdrawing to his tower, or Heaney with his image of being a wood kern escaped from a massacre lurking in the undergrowth. And this is connected with the theme of defensive evasion, being left open to the accusations of others as well as of oneself. The expectations, I mean, when a poet is expected to be the spokesperson of their times. And that's another point of linkage here, because that is, in both their lives, posited constantly against the need for privacy, the need for independence, the need for integrity preserved on a private level. There are other elements too, because when Yeats is processing the seismic upheavals of violent events in Ireland from 1916, he's simultaneously following a very careful course politically in terms of publicizing those words. His famous poem about the rising Easter 1916, written immediately after the rising in the summer, we know we can track its writing process very closely, was kept out of the public I, for a long time, it was circulated in a sort of Samizdat form. It finally came out in 1921 in the New Statesman magazine, which was campaigning for, the, for clemency towards the mayor of Cork, Terence McSweeney, who was dying on hunger strike. So a very political use of the poem, a very political place to, to enshrine it. And I think this reflects the deeply complicated way that Yeats is managing his life and his, his public position, which again has echoes with Heaney's position in the 1970s. There's another example of a poem about violence and civil war that Yeats writes, well, about the Anglo-Irish War, which is a different kind of thing. It's written in 1920, and like many of his poems, it's addressed to a ghost, the dead son of his friend Augusta Gregory, who didn't want it printed, so he withdrew it from the Nation magazine. It's called Reprisals, and it's about the go British government's policy of reprisals against Republicans and the cruelty inflicted by the black and tans on people around where Yeats and indeed Lady Gregory had their houses, Gort, County Galway. But it's a poem that never saw the light of day until 1948, decades after the events which it tried to commemorate. It's not a very good poem, but it's more heartfelt, I think, than Lady Gregory thought. She didn't like it, she thought it was contrived. And Yeats kept it out of the public eye, partly because his friend didn't like it, but also, I think, for complicated political reasons. And Yeats's strategies are always complicated. They stretch to the dating of his poems, even the poem I've just quoted from, 1919. Why is it called 1919? The incidents it describes take place in 1920. It was published it was written in 1921. The processes and the obscurities have to be seen connected once again to Yeats's complex public life and to his attempt to put a shape on civilization and its decline. He's working on his extraordinary philosophical treatise of vision at the time, and he decides 1919 is a key moment in historical 2000 year cycles. So he retitles the poem 1919, thus confusing critics for many years from that day to this. And Yeats's politics at the time that we're considering here, the years after 1916, culminating in 1923, are very difficult. He's a long and combative relationship with certain elements of Irish nationalism and its representatives. He <coughs> never reconciles himself with the Sinn Féin leadership of Arthur Griffith, though he eventually endorses the Sinn Féin project, but not until 1920. 
while he could strategically invoke his own very radical political youth, his Fenian period, he did it rather grudgingly, I think, and his journey back to supporting advanced nationalism followed a very tortuous path. It's also affected by the fact that he's reflecting in his poetry, and I think of poems which I'll come to later, like um, uh, um, The Second Coming. He's reflecting on an, an, an upheaval which is global, which is European, which is far more than just the local difficulties in Ireland. I'll come back to that later, but it's worth now looking a little at Seamus Heaney's parallel position when he begins publishing poetry from the early 60s against what will soon become a background of violence. His first book, Death of a Nationalist, Naturalist, that's a very Freudian slip, in 1966 became legendary. And the subject matter is rural pastoral. It's the life of small farms in rural Ulster, beautifully evoked. But the tone underneath it is different. There's a threatening imagery of guns, of bombs, of secrecy, of confinement, and over and over again of violence. And by the time of his third collection in 1973, Wintering Out, Knights in Northern Ireland had become, in Yeats's phrase, dragon ridden. And the poems which Heaney had been writing from 1969 reflected this explicit terror and the world of separation, tradition, and history upon which it rested. The great prophetic poem about this is The Tolland Man, published in 1970, which indicated that metaphor of bodies preserved in bogland, which he would later make the absolute center of his great book, North. And his manner, and the manner in which he'd approached the whole subject of violence and the codes by which it operates and survives. But it's interesting to look, just as with Yeats and that poem, Reprisals, it's interesting to look at the poetry that he didn't publish at this critical time. I can't show you the words of them because they're sort of embargoed still, and the, the Heaney estate will not have them, quite rightly, put into common currency. But they do exist in various collections. One is called Lint Water, and it was published in the TLS in 1965, but he withdrew it afterwards. And it uses the metaphor of poisoned lands, which of course John Montague would use in his own book of poetry around this time. Putrid currents floated trout to the lock, their bellies white as linen tablecloths. The linen industry is used as an objective correlative for sectarian work patterns blending into sectarian violence here. It's a very political poem, but it's not included in any of his collections. The tentative politics of his second collection in 1969 took a more decided form, and that's where you have his well-known poem, Requiem for the Croppies, with this powerful image of the pockets full of barley seeds in the clothes of the dead rebels of 1798, which later will sprout from the ground, creating green barley and obviously representing the rebirth of nationalism. But a year after he, well, after 1969, with the British Army on the streets of Belfast and the birth of the Provisional IRA, Heaney withdrew this poem from circulation. He stopped reading it at collections. It was in print, but he felt that it would be interpreted as a political gesture which he was not prepared to make. And that brings us back to the idea of evasion. And when a poet stops using or quoting or manipulating the works which he or she has already written. And it's an issue that would separate Heaney from many of his contemporaries. He was a supporter of the civil rights movement, that is clear. He went on marches. He was fiercely conscious of the injustices under which the Catholic population lived. But he wasn't actively involved in politics. But when you look at the unpublished work again, these poems that can't be formally quoted, they suggest a much angrier commitment than appears in public. And there are notebooks from 69 to 71 containing drafts which are clumsily expressive of protest politics and where such activity might lead. References to Stormont as that porticoed cake on the hill where the icing got poisoned. An abandoned poem called Ulster Politics, which implicitly evokes Swift about the blocked bowel of Ireland, which needs, has had an apparent, get a baton, a Bible, a drum, let nobody sit down or run. This is a clean country, understand, that all must end in wind. <laughs> 
Again, it's not by no, no means a distinguished poem. This was probably could never have been resurrected into a more effective piece of rhetoric. But it shows, I think, the way his mind is working. There's another intriguing draft where he sets off to take part in a political demonstration, leaving his father in the fields of their farm and questioning how far civil rights have any meaning for his father's generation as opposed to his and how he is looked on. And it's self-critically interesting in this poem, which I can't quote too much of. He um, implicitly identifies himself with Yeats. A smiling public man, I knew it all. A bourgeois Easter with his family. Cottage industries poet, but successful. Rather cautious to be called an alley. In some drafts, political violence is dealt with directly rather than metaphorically. And in, a, again, a brutal and very un like way, because when one thinks of the way Heaney finally finds his way to writing about violence, sectarianism, murder, it's through a strategy of obliqueness. It's not the head-on. Of course, he's a, he's a much younger man when he's writing these poems, but he's also in a fury, and the fury can come through the drafts. There's also his interest, which continues in the 1798 Rising, and that moment of possible cooperation between Presbyterian Republican radicals and expropriated, excluded Catholics. And he actually involves himself in a lot of educational, as some of you in this room may well know, educational initiatives about this in the 60s for the BBC and other outlets. It's a bit like Yeats's early Fenian poems and his invocation of Kathleen O'Houlihan. The parallels between their lives continue, I think, strangely symmetrical because one reason why Lady Gregory didn't like that poem, Reprisals, was that Yeats wrote it when he wasn't living in Ireland. He was living in the Thames Valley quite safely while these things were going on. That's why she thought it was essentially phony. And he, was, he received stick, therefore, from some of his more involved friends for this. Similarly, Heaney would raise a, a similar reaction when in 1972 he moved from Belfast to rural County Wicklow. Like Yeats, he had a young family to think of and he needed space to breathe and think. But again, exactly as with Yeats, a change of position, a change of locale, clarified and liberated something in his imagination, galvanized him into poems of poetic <coughs> interrogation. 1972, one of the worst years in the downward spiral of Northern Ireland, opened with the bloody Sunday killings in Derry on the 30th of January, to which the poet Thomas Kinsel and others responded with furious public declarations. Heaney himself went to the funerals. He wrote an, again, uncollected ballad commemorating the victims for Luke Kelly to sing. And the horrors of the 1970s in Northern Ireland lie close to the poems in his next collection, notably <coughs> Fieldwork. But he still refuses, much as Yeats had done after 1916, to take the obvious line. It's very striking, this. So it's the background to the um, volume North in 1975, where reactions explode from the South. It's worth quoting a long and agonized private letter of Heaney's in February 1973 to Brendan Hamill, who was a poet, an ex-pupil of his, and um, clearly had written, we've have, we haven't Hammond's letter, unfortunately, but we only have T. Heaney's reply, had written to him, taking him on about politics. And in this letter, Heaney directly confronts the accusations of a, a poet like himself being evasive at a time when people expect him to take up a position. He argues that he has written political poems. He mentions Requiem for the Croppies. He says that these poems come out of the Irish part of his psyche. Quote, I was not very politically conscious as a poet. I began to write with a desire to make poems adequate to my personal experience and to my sense of the English language. Ted Hughes was as important to me as Patrick Kavanagh. England was as much an audience as Ireland. And Yeats comes to mind here too when Heaney writes about the word as magical. He says, you, writing turns the act into an act of consecration where the bread and wine of daily life is consecrated into the host of language, the living wafer of art. <coughs> this very religious, religious almost language applied to writing is something Heaney was taken to task for by several of his friends and contemporaries. But he never, he never quite loses it, I think. 
in this letter, which is too long to quote more of, but is, I think, very indicative, he says that when politics come into a poem, it's as a celebration of a cultural deposit. Politics, to put it another way, are almost indistinguishable from history with me. Which Yeats could have said as well, I think. It's a very, I think, illuminating thing to say. He continues, even as the violence proceeded, I still sought ways of keeping within the style and landscape of my earlier poems. I still waited for the poems to accrue around seminal images. I refused to allow the will to direct the motion of the imagination. That's a very Yeatsian distinction. I tried to be non-partisan and to comprehend all that was happening within the terms of history and myth. Again, pure Yeats that. Heaney concludes, an intense fidelity to one's tribe can only lead to a continuous cycle of revenge. That's what we have anyway. But to embrace it as the truth goes against the grain of Christian humanist feelings, or does it go against the grain just of liberalism? And he's, he, he, he declares he's unsatisfied by how he's responded to the terrible crisis in the North. But at the same time, he firmly adheres to his right and his need to be independent. And when he publishes North, just two years after he wrote that letter, as is well known, it was sparked by his reading of P.V. Glob's book about the dis discovery of prehistoric bodies preserved in the bogs of Denmark, which have been ritually killed. And that's, that's where he finally hits upon the image he wants, where he finally pulls out this image for the preservation of antagonistic identities through the ages. Beginning with the poem I mentioned earlier, The Tolland Man, written in 1970 at a sitting late at night, when he felt he had finally crossed a line, as he put it in a private recollection, I felt it a vow. The body that he writes about, dredged up from the bog, has been ritually sacrificed, and the poet immediately connects the victim to more recent murders, sectarian rather than ritualistic. The scattered, ambushed flesh of labourers, stockinged corpses laid out in the farmyards, telltale skin and teeth flecking the sleepers of four young brothers trailed for miles along the lines. And that's finally where the poetic stance of observation and the tribal impulse of identification come powerfully together. He says he will visit Aarhus in Denmark to look at the corpse's peat brown head, the mild pods of his eyelids his pointed skin cap. And then he says this really surprising thing, that this will enable him to imbibe something of his sad freedom. Out there in Jutland, in the old man-killing parishes, I will feel lost, unhappy, and at home. And that's a very prophetic signature, the signature to the ends of Heaney's poems, like Yeats's are always very important and often quite dramatic. It raises two questions which lay at the centre of the growing debate on Heaney's work. How far does the image of ancient, repetitive, sacrificial violence imply that you're just taking a defeatist, acquiescent, almost um, passive approach to horrors in the present? And how far does the poet's stance as observer and recorder entail and allow him or her to identify with victims? Is that morally, ethically even possible? Well, these are the questions that come sharply into focus with the publication of North. And if you're old enough as I am to remember what it felt like to read that book in 1975 and then to follow the controversies about it, it'll be very vivid. Fascinatingly, I've just read in a private letter of Heaney's, in the new selected letters that's about to be published, that he referred to North as his, quote, responsibilities. That's Yeats's key volume in 1914, where Yeats adopts a harsh new voice, or where his harsh new voice comes into obvious focus. And I'm very struck by Heaney writing to his friend Tom Flanagan on 25 October 1974, something I didn't know when I wrote that book. He wrote to Flanagan, I've done the deed, it means finished north. It's a pitch towards responsibilities, in, in italics, that means the title. Of a sort of, it's a sort of beginning, not so much in dreams, as in the brute ordinariness of what has happened to us. The family afflicted by a father, bewildered by this word poet, and us, the crowd, driven to kill one another with a certain aplomb, insouciance, 
whatever. And the way he conveys that insouciance is in the extraordinary tone of the poems in North. Poems like Punishment, Kinship, Exposure, Funeral Rites, which deeply offended many readers and angered others. Kieran Carson accused him of normalising violence and terror, hinting that it was encoded in the northern DNA and taking refuge in a kind of easy determinism, which is exactly actually what the, you could, the accusation you could level at Yeats if you take a strict reading of the section of 1919, which surveys violent politics by evoking historical repetition. Yeats being Yeats, he does this by the beautiful image of dancers dancing with a, a ribbon of cloth, winding it between them and creating a dragon-like shape, which he had seen the, in the 1890s, the avant-garde American choreographer, Louis Fuller, do. And I have found on YouTube, and I'm not clever enough to link it into your um, illustrations tonight, but on YouTube you can find an 1897 film of Louis Fuller dancing with that great ribbon of cloth weaving around. As Yeats transformed this into an image for violence, he wrote, when Louis Fuller's Chinese dancers enwound a shining web, a floating ribbon of cloth, it seemed that a dragon of air had fallen among the dancers, had whirled them round, or hurried them off on its own furious path. So the platonic year whirls out new right and wrong, whirls in the old instead. All men are dancers, and their tread goes to the barbarous clangor of a gong. And I think that barbarous clangor of a gong suggests recurrence, suggests inevitability, suggests we can't do anything about this. Yet the way that Yeats is framing the world of terror and violence bursting around his head, and this is in 1921, isn't just a defeatist acceptance of fate. I think it has to be read, and I've said this earlier, in conjunction with his attempt to make sense of history as a repetitious arrangement of cycles taking around 2,000 years to complete. That's what he'll publish in his book, A Vision, in 1925. And here, and this is exactly as with Heaney's patterning of Nordic and Irish histories of violence, the idea of historical repetition isn't a simple matter. It isn't just that things happen and come round like the years, um, phases of the moon or whatever. It means that it's a complex structure of interpenetrating themes. That's what Yeats used his idea of the jars for. And Yeats is trying, in the words Heaney would use so many decades <coughs> later, to comprehend all that is happening in terms of history and myth. Problematic combination, especially for historians. Now, to examine this background fully would it require a detailed treatment of the apocalyptic themes that pulse through Yeats's writings from the beginning of World War I and then the beginning of the Anglo-Irish War. And it's epitomized, as I've said, in his grim poem, The Second Coming, with this appalling vision of an Eastern Annunciation, which isn't going to be a reconciling Christ child. It's going to be a rough beast bringing images of destruction rather than redemption. At the same time, he's writing in a very ominous essay called If I Were Four and Twenty, attempting to analyze the di dialectic of history thrown into sharp relief by the First World War, the Bolshevik Revolution, and the accompanying violence and mass killings, which he writes about a lot in lectures and uh, correspondence at the time. And what Yeats is doing is trying to search a structure to erect against the impending collapse. And this is why I call this essay if I were four and twenty, very ominous. He says he's looking for a way, quote, to unite our economics and our nationalism with our religion, united into a philosophy. And this seems to him a more desirable future than either embracing a strict logic of materialism or relying on random happenstance. He, what he's doing, in fact, is forecasting a shift to totalitarianism. And this is in 1919. Perhaps we are restless because we approach a realization that our general will must surrender itself to another will within it, interpreted by certain men, at once economists, patriots, and inquisitors. And this obviously anticipates his interest in fascism a decade later. Now, this wasn't unusual. Yeats isn't alone in thinking the First World War blows apart liberal expectations of settled futures and decent behavior. Henry James writes this over and over again about the plunge of civilization in 1914 into an abyss 
of blood and darkness, James wrote, it gives away the whole long age during which we've supposed the world to be, with whatever abatement, gradually bettering. Even more strikingly, John Maynard Keynes wrote that the events of World War I and its aftermath, and this is what Yeats is forecasting in 1919, the violence that follows war, Keynes wrote, civilization is a thin and precarious crust erected by the personality and will of a very few and only maintained by rules and conventions skillfully put across and guilefully preserved. Now, I don't think Yeats would have had much faith in Keynes's rules and conventions, but it's a very parallel to what he, Yeats would later write in his wonderful little poem, Meru, which is about a comprehension of history and myth yet again, and about the re recurrent cycles of violence and terror. Civilization is hooped together, brought under a rule, under the semblance of peace, by manifold illusion, but man's life is thought, and he, despite his terror, cannot cease ravening through century after century, ravening, raging, and uprooting, that he may come into the desolation of reality. Returning to 1919, the first two sections of the poem heighten the, exactly this kind of disillusionment and dislocation created when terror stalks the world once more and imply, as I've said before, that there is a pattern of recurrence measured by the clanging of a gong. Internecine savagery is reborn time and time again, and that's the great image of weasels fighting in a hole, fighting each other for the sake of it, in fact. But Yeats's poem also posits the artist as a lonely individual, suggesting philosophical metaphors which will overcome the deadly repetitions of violence. Though his, the last section, it's too long a poem to go into in detail, and many of you may know it already, but the last section climaxes in a dazzling, if obscure, vision of horses running wild in terror on lonely roads, spurred by the Furies. So, we have two Irish poets writing 50 years apart, reflecting on terror and violence, and the appropriate strategies open to a poet faced with reflecting their times. And as we've seen, Yeats opens out the theme. He opens it out into the advent of terror into history. He wants to encompass much more than Ireland's local difficulties. He wants to write about world history, the collapse of world civilizations, which he senses he is seeing in the terrible aftermath to the terrible First World War. Historians now are taking the view that the First World War doesn't end neatly on Armistice Day to be celebrated next week. It carries on, especially in Central Europe. It doesn't stop. And if you know anything about Hungarian or Polish or Russian history, you will see exactly what they're writing about. Then think of Ireland and think of it as cognate to those Central European continuities of violence. And you have one of those, one of those parallels in history which you can only get to grips with if you take yourself out of a self-regarding um, essentialist view of your local national experience. But is Heaney opening out his approach to violence in the same kind of way? Certainly Richard Murphy in that big review of North thought so. He said that Heaney is connecting the brutal real atrocities which we have been shown on television for the past seven years with rituals of human sacrifice in remote antiquity. His poetry traces modern terrorism back to its roots in the early Iron Age, and mysterious awe back to the bone house of language itself. He looks at our funeral rites and our worship of the past. The whole of northern civilization from Denmark to Donegal is his locale. We hear of Thor and Gunnar as well as Hercules, the Vikings as well as Sir Walter Raleigh. The central image of this work, the symbol which unifies time, person, and place is Bogland. It contains, preserves, and yields up terror as well as awe. And then he goes on to take an absolutely diametrically opposite line to Kieran Carson. He says, this isn't okaying violence. This isn't despairingly saying it's encoded in our DNA and it's always going to happen. It's, in Murphy's view, seriously attempting to purge our land of its terrible blood guilt and acknowledge our enslavement to a sacrificial myth. It may go a long way towards freeing us from the myth by portraying it in its true archaic shape and color, not disguising its brutality. 
Naturally, we wonder where he himself stands in relations to victims and killers. He makes no pretense about his deep uncertainty. Well, North was a landmark. It was a landmark, I think, in modern Irish literature. It had the effect, perhaps, of a book like Proofrock did in the 1920s. It's, it has a sense of the impact of the wasteland. It, I think, is, is in, in terms of Irish literary history, and history in Ireland is intimately interconnected with literature. History and literature interpenetrate each other, and North is a great instance of that. But it didn't end Heaney's project of processing terror and violence in history. He goes on with his Homeric preoccupations. If you think of a later poem like My Scene I Look Out, one of his most terrifyingly explorations of violence and blood guilt, I think he's thinking as much of, of, of um, Ireland as of Peloponnesian Greece. If you think of Heaney's own word for this, it, it bears it out completely. He's very interesting in an honorary degree speech he gives at Urbino, which again I discovered quite recently, where he gave a much more self-revealing lecture than he usually did about his own position vis-a-vis -vis history and violence in Ireland. Yeats, of course, features because he's talking about Urbino, but so does Dante. And he connects his own obsession with the Ugolino tale in Dante's Inferno. He connects it directly to Republican prisoners' experience of the dirty protest. And when he moves on to Virgil, he gives a piece of autobiography, which doesn't occur elsewhere in the Heaney oeuvre, where he connects his own inspiration to the terrors he had witnessed. He said to his Italian audience, Virgil moved from his father's farm in the north to a poet's retreat outside Naples in the south. I made a similar move from Ulster to Wicklow in Dublin. Virgil lived through civil war in the aftermath of Julius Caesar's assassination. I have experienced not only the civic violence of Ulster, but thanks to the age of technology, I have witnessed civil wars and ethnic conflicts all over the globe, blanket bombing and terrorist attacks. Virgil saw the roads of Italy full of dispossessed laborers and erstwhile estate owners, people like Virgil's own father driven out of their holdings by Caesar's veterans, forced to yield up their homes and their land at sword point. I have seen the streets of Belfast burn and then fill with neighbors driven out by other neighbors. But I have also lived to see refugees return to the roads of Europe and Asia and Africa, to the ports, to the border posts, even to the local traffic lights where they plead to be allowed to sell you a flower or wash your windscreen. And there again, he's opening out, broadening out local violence into repetitive European world patterns of violence and identifying himself rather bravely with Virgil. But he's doing this because he thinks Virgil shows how a poet can combine a gift for pastoral with an ability to conjure the brutality and terror of his, dream, of his times. And he does this in the poems that he writes about the violence that he sees over the next two decades of his own life. Just like the way he uses Horace in his poem, Anything Can Happen. Sorry, I meant to show a picture. There, that's what I want. I won't read it because I don't want to overstay my time. But it is, it's, I'd like you to look at the phrase towards the end, stropped beak fortune because he's echoing here Yeats's brazen hawks and clanging wings that have put out the moon invoked in his great poem, Meditations in Time of Civil War. And I want to return to the echoes of Yeats in later Heaney and the way both poets continue to face up to a history of violence and terror. It's specifically pinpointed in Heaney's lecture on receiving the Nobel Prize in 1995 where he evokes Yeats' the second great poem sequence about terror and violence, Meditations in Time of Civil War. I'd like to talk a bit about this because it's a companion piece to 1919. They're placed together in his great volume, The Tower. Meditations was written two years after 1919. He begins it at Kuhl in 1922, and he finishes it exactly 100 years ago in 1923 at Bally Lee, when he's living in his tower house at Gort with his young family. He has moved to Ireland now, so if you like, he has the right to write about the violence that's breaking out all around him. 
and the tower would become the great symbol for his view of Irish history and myth and would be this, the cover of his great collection in 1928. Meditations in Time of Civil War begins with the marvellous stanzas of ancestral houses where he takes the theme of great Irish houses to suggest ominously that violence and bitterness are an inescapable part of building a civilization and that as a civilization becomes settled and sane and easy, it loses the bite and the energy that made it great, which is also connected with violence. It's a rather worrying message. What if the glory of a scutcheon doors and buildings that a haughtier age designed, the pacing to and fro on polished floors amid great chambers and long galleries lined with famous portraits of our ancestors, what if those things the greatest of mankind consider most to magnify or to bless, but take our greatness with our bitterness? And the next sections of the poem come down from this great grandeur and height and in much simpler language profiles civil war rumbling all around the tower and what it's like to live and write in a world lit by explosions and house burnings and cars passing his front door with coffins upright in the back seat and dead young soldiers in their blood carried past his bridge. One felt, he wrote later, an overmastering desire not to grow unhappy or embittered, not to lose all sense of the beauty of nature, a star our West of Ireland name for a starling had built in a hole beside my window and I made these verses out of the feeling of the moment. And then comes this great passage from Meditations in Time of Civil War, written, as I say, exactly a hundred years ago. The bees build in the crevices of loosening masonry and there the mother birds bring grubs and flies. My wall is loosening. Honey bees come build in the empty house of the stair. We are closed in and the key is turned on our uncertainty. Somewhere a man is killed or a house burned, yet no clear fact to be discerned come build in the empty house of the star. A barricade of stone or of wood, some 14 days of civil war. Last night they trundled down the road, that dead young soldier in his blood, come build in the empty house of the star. We had fed the heart on fantasies, the heart's grown brutal from the fair, more substance in our enmities than in our love. O oh, honeybees, come build in the empty house of the stair. But the sequence then ends with a poem which rather echoes 1919, a complex meditation on the inheritance of violence and again those clanging wings and the terrible vengeance of the Furies. So though Yeats is capable of invoking this beautiful prayer to peace, he can also right and he ends the poem in a much less hopeful way. Much more could be said about the way that Yeats writes about and transcends the theme of terror in his poems of the 1920s. But in conclusion I want to connect this back to Heaney and the way that he followed Yeats. Because the older Heaney gets the less afraid he is of the comparisons with Yeats. He has in a sense earned them. He doesn't bat them off in the way that he does as a more careful young operator. And this is particularly true in his speech, Heaney's speech, accepting the Nobel Prize in 1995, where he echoes Yeats in more ways than one. Of course, Yeats had been awarded the prize exactly 100 years ago, 1923. We've heard a lot about that recently. And like Heaney, he traveled to Stockholm to receive it. But despite the conditions of Ireland at the time, just coming out of the Civil War, just emerging from terrible violence, Yeats barely mentioned the subject of terror and violence in his speeches in, 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 in Stockholm, even though that's exactly what, as I've tried to show, had been dominating his great poem sequences written in the immediately preceding period. He spoke about the Irish dramatic movement, he spoke about Singh and Lady Gregory and himself and cultural revolution. He avoided violence. He oddly assumed that he was being recognized as a playwright rather than a poet. And this was something of a surprise to many people who had not thought of him in that light at all. Faced with the horror of repetitive violence and the uncertainties of civilization, he tends to turn aside. Heaney, by contrast, and as I think deliberately facing up to Yeats, chose in his Nobel lecture to concentrate on a history of violence and terror, 
and the manner in which poetry can rise to a terrible occasion. And he does this, he plays for very high stakes by choosing the most horrific incident, 1976, when a minib minibus carrying textile workers home was ambushed in South Armagh, the infamous um, massacre that you will all remember, King's Mill. The gunmen lined up their potential victims and asked which of the workers was a Catholic and the single Catholic among them stepped out. Though his Protestant co-workers silently tried to hold him back, assuming that he used to be singled as a target. In fact, the killers were Republicans and they told the Catholic to leave and then murdered the remainder in an orgy of bloodletting, which is unbearable to read. In the catalogue of terrorist atrocity, this episode ranks unspeakably high. But for Heaney to highlight it, and to highlight it in a lecture which began with a beautiful invocation of learning to read and listening to the radio, lovely invocation of childhood, it's this essay, this um, speech called Crediting Poetry, moves on to confront um, mercilessly this terrible incident. And he accomplishes this shift by utilising Yeats and that poem we've just seen, The Stairs Nest by My Window, which counterpoints external brutality with an invocation of family love and the need to build in the face of horror. As Heaney puts it, Yeats's poetic evocation takes in not only the nurturing mother love of the birds, but the massacre on the side of the roadside and retains faith in the squeeze of the hand, the actuality of sympathy and protectiveness between living creatures. This is true and it was perfect for Heaney's purposes in 1995. But in fact, as Yeats aged and the 1920s darkened into the 1930s, Yeats withdrew into a more hieratic stance, refused to take a public stand, and in his chosen epitaph under Ben Bulban, he bequeathed a tirade of really about nihilization and left, I think, a regrettably bombastic inheritance. By contrast, this preoccupation with what poetry can do to transcend terror remained with Heaney to the end of his life. In October 2012, less than a year before he died, he opened a lecture to the Law Society in Dublin by raising the question yet again. And he starts with W.H. Auden's Elegy in Memory of Yeats, written in 1939 as Europe faced into the abyss of violence. The second section elegizes the poet and takes on exactly the question I'm trying to talk about, what is the poet's task directly? You are silly like us. Your gift survived it all. The parish of rich women, physical decay, yourself. Mad Ireland hurt you into poetry. Now Ireland has her madness and her weather still. For poetry makes nothing happen. It survives in the valley of its making, where executives would never want to temper, flows on south from ranches of isolation and the busy griefs, raw towns that we believe and die in. It survives a way of happening, a mouth. Auden's concluding verses in this elegy to Yeats look into the abyss of violence and nihilism and I think rather unconvincingly end up with an injunction to the poet to keep on singing. I will read these verses. Earth receive an honoured guest, William Yeats is laid to rest. I just, I think I have. Yes, I have it. <laughs> Let the Irish vessel lie emptied of its poetry. In the nightmare of the dark, all the dogs of Europe bark and the living nations wait, each sequestered in its hate. Intellectual disgrace stares from every human face and the seas of pity lie locked and frozen in each eye. Follow, poet, follow right to the bottom of the night with your unconstraining voice still persuade us to rejoice. With the farming of a verse, make a vineyard of the curse. Sing of human unsuccess in a rapture of distress. In the deserts of the heart, let the healing fountain start. In the prison of his days, teach the free man how to praise. I, for one, am unconvinced. Back to Heaney, who in the late lecture where he takes up Auden says, implicit in Auden's poem about Yeats 
is the question of art's ability to face atrocity, which is where my title comes from, or perhaps more accurately, to outface atrocity. Auden is being haunted here by a perennial question, what good is poetry in a world of suffering and injustice? He went on to discuss the importance of individual imaginative work in the formation of human and humanist values and the pressures of public life, which he knew better than almost anyone, on the private writer. The Eastern European poets who meant so much to him are, of course, invoked, especially Czeslav Milos, but also the Hungarian lyric poet Miklos Radnoti, shot on a forced march in 1944 after unimaginable suffering, but Radnoti kept throughout the horrors of his last weeks, he kept a notebook on him in which he wrote eclogues, which would become his inheritance and preserve, as Heaney put it, a voice for his people at their moment of greatest terror. Heaney also quotes Albert Camus' statement that writers must put themselves not at the service of those who make history, but those who suffer it, but retain faith in the double existence of viewing the horrors of eternal existence and returning to the beauty of artistic creativ creativity. It reminds me of another phrase he loved, the second life of art which is from, I think, Eugenio Montali, the Italian poet, and he believed that was where the poet could retire. Heaney's own work confronts terror in order to transcend it, I think more consistently and uncompromisingly than often allowed. And I would argue that he does it more effectively than Yeats, because more concretely and less evasively. And I'm going to conclude by another reflection from the private letters of Heaney, from 2002, yet again about the poet's task faced with atrocity, where he wrote, the written line can in its own way be a kind of front line. It's the truth, artistic as well as moral truth that counts. That's what people want. And they recognize it, not in the volume or the message, but in the pitch of the tuning, the emotional urgency of what's at stake. He concludes this passionate letter by invoking the contrasting attitudes of Czeslaw Milos and Joseph Brodsky to writing about atrocity and tyranny. Brodsky's rather Yeatsian belief that art celebrates the privacy of the human condition and has nothing whatever to do with politics or public stances. And he contrasts that with Milos's defiant poem, The World, written in Warsaw in 1943, and his polemic against totalitarianism, The Captive Mind. He ends by saying, there are different ways of doing things at different times. The worst thing is to fake it, good or bad. Remarkably, I think he never did. I'm not sure if we can say the same for Yeats, but that's subject for another lecture. Thank you.